Okay, well, welcome to the June webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Sarah Noel to our webinar, who will share with us some of the history of the Apollo program and look forward to future missions to the moon. Dr. Sarah Noble is currently a program scientist at NASA headquarters, working on a variety of missions to explore the solar system. Please welcome Sarah Noble. Hi, hey, everybody. I am happy to be here. I'm going to share some slides. Can you all see the slides? Yep, they look great. Looking good. Great. Uh, so um, I'm going to start out here. Just a just a quick note about who I am. Um, born and raised in Minnesota. I went to the University of Minnesota. I got a degree in geology. Uh, got graduate degrees from Brown. Uh, and then I worked briefly for Congress, actually doing some space policy. Uh, and then I started wandering around NASA in what I like to refer to as my NASA nomad phase. Uh, spent some time at JSC, came to headquarters, uh, and then down to Alabama, and then to Maryland, and then finally stuck around at headquarters. I'm sorry, that's my, that's my cat in the background. I apologize. Luna is very excited about the moon. <laughs> Uh, and now I've been at NASA headquarters for about eight years now um, and doing a lot of fun stuff, uh, including working a, a lot on the moon. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit today about Apollo and what we learned about the moon from Apollo um, and also what we've learned since and, and why it is time to go back and what we're going to learn when we, when we do go back. So um, I think Apollo is, is interesting in a way because it's a different, it's a different, we started out different than we do with most of our robotic exploration. Usually we start with a lot of robots first, uh, and samples is something that happens way down the road. But, but with Apollo, we had two big advantages. We had humans on the surface with their human brains, uh, which allowed us to do some great on the ground geology. And we brought back samples, a lot of samples, so many samples. We brought back 850 pounds of samples, um, and that allowed us um, to give them out to people, not just a handful of scientists, but literally hundreds and hundreds of scientists over the years have had the opportunity to work with these samples, including, including me. I did a lot of my graduate work uh, on these samples. So hopefully you guys are all pretty familiar with what this is. This is, this is the moon, and at least the, at least the near side should, should look very familiar to you. Um, we don't actually see the far side very often, and so I took a minute and take a look at that and think about how the near and far side are actually quite different from each other. Uh, namely, in that you should notice that there are dark bits and bright bits, right? We call those the mare and the highland. Um, uh, and, and actually, the geology of the moon is pretty simple because it really only can, is made up of these two kinds of rocks. So let's talk a little bit about these kinds of rocks. So first of all, mare, right, is, um, is just basalt, right? It's very similar to the kinds of rocks that you would find in Hawaii coming out of volcanoes. Um, I put the chemical formulas in here not because I think they're that exciting, but because they show you that, that these are rocks are made out of basically the same stuff as rocks here on Earth, iron and magnesium and silica and oxygen, and calcium. It's not that exotic, right? The moon is, is made out of the same kinds of things that the Earth is made out of. Um, occasionally, you do get some weird stuff. And I made note here of two strange minerals that we actually found in Apollo samples, um, tranquil tranquiliotite and armalkylite. Um, these are, were minerals that were first discovered at the, on the moon, but actually since then we have found them on Earth as well. So they are, not, they are not so exotic that they don't exist other places. But we found them first on the moon, and so we got to name them, and they got great names, right? Tranquiliotite, named after, of course, Tranquility Base, where Apollo 11 landed. Uh, our milk light's a little, a little bit more difficult. Has anybody guessed what that stands for? Think about the Apollo 11 crew, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. They got to name their own, their own mineral. The highlands, the bright parts of the moon, are actually even simpler. It's all basically one mineral. It's a mineral called plagioclase feldspar, calcium silicate aluminum. Uh, and, it, and it's basically one of the most common minerals on Earth as well. And in fact, if, if you all go home tonight and look at your granite countertops, right, if you can find the white mineral in granite, that is plagioclase feldspar, um, the same mineral that, that it makes up a large chunk of the moon. Okay, so the question is, how did we end up with this Marian Highland mix? 
And the basic idea, the basic philosophy we have for how the moon was formed is that somewhere uh, around four and a half billion years ago, something really big slammed into the earth, something about the size of Mars uh, hit the earth and it kicked off a lot of material, right? And that material sort of came together and coalesced to form what we think of as, as, as the moon. So it formed mostly out of the, the crust and upper mantle, not the cores of, these, of, the, of the earth and, this, and the impactor. And it was very, very hot. Right. And so it was formed probably mostly molten and a lot of the volatiles, a lot of volatile elements, the things that burn off really easily, like water, were lost. Right. And so that gives us our basic sort of framework for how the, the moon formed then. Right. The moon was basically entirely molten. Uh, and then the plagioclase started floating. Right. So plagioclase, right, that, that, mineral, that white mineral and granite is actually very light and it will float as it, as it starts to crystallize, whereas the other minerals are heavy, and so they'll sink. And so what happens is you form this sort of crust of this bright plagioclase material while all of the other minerals sank. Uh, and then eventually, um, later on, there were impacts that came and broke, about, broke apart that crust, and, and then those impacts later on were filled with, with volcanoes, uh, with lava come, coming out of volcanoes. And so that cartoon is not the greatest to give you a picture of inside the moon, but we actually do know a fair amount about the inside of the moon uh, because we had seismometers. Several of the Apollo missions, uh, 12, 14, 15, and 16, had seismometers on them. And we actually had a seismic network active on the moon for about five years during Apollo. We got great data from it, and even today we're still looking at that data. So this is a, a recent paper, a paper from just a few years ago, uh, where we finally were able to confirm from that data that the moon does in fact have a core. It's a small core, but like our core, it is solid inner core, fluid outer core. So we actually have a, a lot in common with the instru internal structure of the moon. But you can see in this cutaway that it's actually quite small compared to the radius of the moon. Um, but you know, it's great. We're still learning about the moon. The thing with the seismic network though, is that all of these, um, seismometers were pretty close together, right? They're all on the near side. They're all sort of in the same part of the moon. And if we really want us to understand the internal structure of the moon, what we really want is a seismic network that covers the whole moon, where you have one size on, seismometers that are far apart so you can see deep down into the, into the deep interiors of the moon more easily. And so that actually that is something that is very high on, on planetary scientists' lists of things to do on the moon. And hopefully this new era of lunar exploration will give us the opportunity to do that. Okay, so we're back to the moon again, the, the front and back of the moon. And these images look a little bit different than the, than the set I showed you earlier. These are actually a compilation of images uh, from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And they're um, put together so that they're all at, at low sun angles. So it really emphasizes the craters. So if you look at the surface of the moon here, you can really see, particularly on the backside, on, on the highlands, all of the craters. And that's sort of amazing when you look at that and, and see just so many craters there, right? There are craters on top of craters on top of craters. Um, and it's interesting to think about how the, the moon and the earth are in the same neighborhood. We've been exposed to the same environment over time, right? So everything that's been hitting the moon, it's also been hitting the earth. Earth is not covered with craters, of course, because our rocks get recycled, right? We have a lot of wind and water and we have plate tectonics. And so the rocks on the earth tend to be much, much younger. So we only have a handful of, of impact crater in our record here on earth, but it's clear that we get hit by stuff all the time. It's a little unnerving enough to keep you up at night. Um, you can also see the difference just between the, the craters in the highland and the craters in the mare, right? There are craters in the mare, but there are so many fewer than there are in the highlands. And this is actually something that geologists use, not just at the moon, but across the solar system to help us understand the ages of different surfaces. The longer something's been sitting out, the more craters it has you can get a sort of relative sense for how old something is by counting the number of craters you see. Uh, and it's important to think about impact events that they really happen at, at all scales, right? So from planet, planetary scales, right? Like the one uh, I'm showing in the upper right here, the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is that giant purple splotch on the, the south, towards the south of the moon, right? That's one impact crater, it was enormous. Uh, cut so deep, it probably cut down through the crust and into the mantle. That's incredible. But you can also get craters that are so, sort of more on a human scale, like a, at the bottom of the screen there, right, and standing next to an astronaut, right, there's a crater maybe the size of a house or, or a city block, right, 
But then you can also get craters that are ridiculously tiny, right? On the right there, I show a crater. So you can see the scale bar is five microns. Uh, for those of you not used to thinking in microns, uh, think about a, a single strand of your hair is, is about 30 or 40 microns across. So you could fit, you know, like eight of those impacts across a single strand of hair. So that's, that's very, very, very tiny. Um, these are the sort of impacts that I study, actually. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, and here again, I was talking about how we can use crater counts to sort of age date different terrains. Here's a great example of this. This is a map that even, even um, you know, if you look at different parts of the mare, they have different numbers of craters on it. So you can divide it up and get a sort of record through time of the volcanoes on the moon and where the old ones are, the ones in purple and blue, and the youngest volcanism on the moon, which is only about a, a billion years old. I know that sounds old, but to geologists, that's, that's like a blink of the eye, right? Um, so we can see where the youngest volcanism is. And this is a, this is a great um, sort of map to tell us where if we want to look at how the, the chemistry of, of, of the volcanoes on the moon changed over time, we can go and sample some of the older ones, we can sample some of the younger ones. Um, and we can also, you know, use this. The moon is the one place in the solar system where we actually have actual dates, right? So crater counting only gives you a relative age. You can say, you know, this has more craters than that. It's, it's older than that. But if we want to tie that to an actual age and go, oh, that's a billion years old, then we need to have samples. And the moon is the one place where we can tie those things together because we have the samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back and we know how old those terrains were. Uh, and so we use that to sort of calibrate our, our time scales for all of the other uh, rocky bodies in the solar system. And so, um, which is great, but it's imperfect. And the more dates we can get on different units, the better we can, we can refine that scale. Uh, so what's with the rays? Uh, you guys look through telescopes a lot. You've probably noticed that the moon has these gorgeous ray systems, um, but not all the craters have rays, right? Only some of them do. Uh, and it's the youngest ones, right? So again, young here is, you know, less than a billion years or less. Um, but still, these young craters have these gorgeous ray systems. Everybody's got their favorite. Mine is, is Proclus, which is a uh, crater there on, on the left hand of the screen. Up near Mare Crisium, it's got, um, it's got a really cool ray pattern because that, that was an impact that actually came in at a, at a sort of glancing angle. It didn't, it didn't come straight down. It came in sideways, and it created this um, asymmetric ejecta pattern, which I think is really cool. It's also easy to find because it's right next to my exam. So, okay. um, so actually what I studied, uh, what my, my PhD thesis was about, was understanding how these grays form and how they disappear. So what happens is when you get a fresh impact in, it exposes fresh material, right? Like this LROC image of a, of, a young, of, a, of a small young crater, right? It exposes that fresh material. The fresh material is very bright, but then over time, um, it starts to get darker. And I study the process by how that starts to get darker. And, and it mostly has to do with those very, very tiny impacts, those little tiny, you know, microns across impacts. Every time one of those comes in and hits, it melts and vaporizes a little tiny bit of the moon. And you can see that the lunar soil there is full of all of this like melt products that, you know, that get sort of draped over, over the outsides of the, of the grains. And at the, the bottom of the screen, uh, you see a TEM image, it's a transmission electron microscope image of a grain of lunar soil. And you can see around it, it's got this sort of ring around the outside full of freckles. Those freckles are actually tiny little blebs of metallic iron that happen in these tiny little impacts. The vapor in these impacts gets so hot that the iron and the minerals separates from the oxygen and you end up with metal, iron metal, um, coating the outside of these grains. And that's sort of opaque and so it changes the optical properties of the surface, and that's what makes the surface dark over time. Okay, so let's talk about some other craters, right? So the craters at the poles um, are, are a really interesting case on the moon because the moon isn't tilted like the Earth. It's basically straight up and down. Its tilt is about like one and a half degrees. So it's pretty much straight up and down, which means that there are places where the sun can't get in, right? It can't get down into the bottoms of these craters, and there are places that just don't get sunlight, that haven't seen sunlight in billions of years, which is kind of incredible. So we've done with uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Rover, it's been in orbit around the moon now for, for about a decade, has spent a lot, lot of time mapping the illumination at, at the poles, and this is a, sort of a, a buildup of that illumination map 
over a six month period. So you can see the places here that are dark, are places that didn't see sunlight, places that are bright up on the rims are places that, that see sunlight most of, or all of the time. Uh, it turns out there's not quite any places that see sunlight all the time. They get pretty close, but not quite. Um, and these are places actually that we are looking at to, to want to land and build, and build some infrastructure, a, a lunar base, because you have a resource there of sunlight. Right? But then there's another resource that you probably heard us talking a lot about, which is, which is water. Right? When we think that these, um, these dark places on the moon are also incredibly cold, incredibly cold. So here's a, a temperature map from one of the instruments uh, on uh, LRO. Uh, and you can see the scale there, and it's a little small, but you can see that those, those purple and blue colors, uh, that's a Kelvin scale. So the purple and blue colors there are down in the like 25, 30 degrees Kelvin, 30 degrees above absolute zero. So this is some of the coldest places in the solar system. This is colder than Pluto, right? These places haven't seen sunlight in billions of years. They're just incredibly cold. And what happens is if there are molecules bouncing around the surface and they end up in one of these cold places, they get trapped there, they get stuck, and they, they have no more, not enough energy to move out. So they stay there. And so we've thought about this for a long time. Uh, we thought, what, you know, what might be hiding in these cold traps? So back in the, the late 90s, we sent a mission called the Lunar Prospector mission uh, to tell us a little bit uh, about that, to see if we could find anything in these cold traps. Uh, and, and the, the instrument on, on Lunar Prospector can't see water, but what it can see is hydrogen. And so it mapped out and it found that over the poles, there's a lot of extra hydrogen, uh, which could have been water, or it could have been just hydrogen. There's no way to know for sure uh, at the time, but we thought, well, you know, this sort of fits our story that there might be water there. Uh, so we actually send another mission. This is, a, this is a great little mission that's launched with, with LRO. It's a mission called LCROSS. And you can see the cutout of the rocket there with the LRO spacecraft. And then there's the LCROSS spacecraft, which was actually the ring that attached LRO to the, to the rocket. And they built the spacecraft out of the ring. It was very ingenious. And what they did was they actually took the, the empty rocket with them to the moon and crashed the empty rocket into the surface of the moon and then flew through the plume with the little spacecraft uh, and, and used a, a number of sensors on that spacecraft to actually find water. And so that was our first real evidence that for sure for, we are certain that there is in fact water uh, in these cold traps. Uh, we found a lot of other stuff in the cold traps too. And in particular, we found a lot of mercury. Uh, so for those of you who are thinking you could just you know, go up and take a drink of that water, you might wanna, you might wanna hold your horses a little bit. Um, they'll all be mad as hatters on the moon. Um, but it's still, <laughs> a very useful resource uh, that we can use for, for fuel uh, and other things. Uh, more recently, we are continuing to sort of explore uh, water at the surface of the moon. And, and this, is a, this is a paper that actually just came out last year looking at, at some more recent orbital data uh, from m cubed as well as some LRO data, where they've actually now been able to, to convince themselves that there's water ice sitting at the surface, sort of frost or ice directly at the surface, uh, all of these places where there are these little blue dots. And so pretty widespread um, across a, a lot of these permanently shadowed regions. Uh, it looks like you have water, at least at the surface. Now we don't know how deep that is. We don't know how much is there. Um, there are a lot of questions we still have about the distribution of this water, but we do know that it exists. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, where we're going from here um, and then um, finally the moon to Mars, right? So, so when we think about Apollo, Apollo actually uh, visited, again, a very narrow piece of the moon, right? It's it, it, about the same amount of the moon as, as North America. So if you were an alien and you came to Earth and the only place you ever visited was North America, yes, you would learn a lot about the Earth, but you would really miss a lot of stuff too, right? You would miss out on Antarctica, right? No polar bears. Uh, you'd miss out on, on the outback in Australia, you'd miss out on the arid desert, you'd miss out on the Him Himalayas, all sorts of things that you, that we, you would totally miss uh, if you only went to North America. And so we can think of the moon in the same way, right? All of the places we visited, are sort of central near side, um, they're actually all in this sort of weird part of the moon where the mare is. Um, we have, we, there's still a lot of the moon left to explore uh, and a lot we don't know about it. Now, since Apollo, right, we have done, we've done our due diligence and we have gone around. Uh, so Apollo came and went, and then there was a huge gap, about, you know, 
20 years. Um, before we went back to the moon at all, there were a couple of little missions in the, in the 90s. Uh, we talked about Prospector as well as Clementine, which was actually a, a Department of Defense mission. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a NASA mission, but Department of Defense wanted to test some sensors and they thought, hey, do you guys want this data of the moon? And we were like, yes, please, please give us the data. Um, but then, you know, starting in about 2009, the last time that NASA got very excited about the moon, uh, we put in a real sort of concentrated effort to look at the moon. So we sent LRO, LCROSS, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper, RAIL, the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, LADEE, which looked at the dust atmos and atmosphere around the moon, and, and not to be confused with the new Artemis mission, there's actually a mission around the moon right now called Artemis, uh, which is a heliophysics mission to understand how the moon interacts with the solar winds. Uh, that's an acronym for Acceleration, Reconnection, Turbulence, and Electrodynamics of the Moon's Interaction with the Sun, which is a little bit of a crazy acronym, uh, but so just, you're not confused. Artemis, all caps, is the heliophysics mission. Artemis, lowercase, is the new plan to go to the moon. <laughs> So two decades now of studying the moon from orbit has really sort of revolutionized our understanding of the moon, right? We now have this, this very global view of the moon. Uh, we know where to go, right? We have a much better understanding of the questions we wanna ask, right? For example, we, we'd, we'd love to go to some of those young volcanics that I was showing you earlier. Um, we also really need to go to the surface to answer the next big questions. We've done a lot of what we can. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we've done everything, but we've done a lot from orbit. Uh, and the next big, big move in, in lunar science, we're going to have to go to the surface in order to understand those things. But we do have a lot of big science questions for the moon, right? So we talked a bit about the polar volatiles. How did they get there? How are they distributed? What are their isotopic and chemical compositions? Um, how did the moon form and evolve? Can we better characterize the lunar interior? I was talking about putting in a seismic network that's very high on our list, as well as other geophysical measurements. Um, are there rock types we didn't sample in Apollo, and what can they tell us about the moon's evolution? Yes, there absolutely are. We know from our remote sensing, in fact, that there are, there are a number of rock types that we just didn't sample in Apollo. They, weren't, they, they didn't exist in the places where we went, but we know where to go now, and we can go and find them. But more than that, uh, as much as I love the moon, and as a lunar scientist, I'm very excited about the science of the moon, but the great thing about the moon is that we can actually really use it to understand the whole solar system and even beyond, right? So we can use the moon to understand the distribution and time scale of impacts and volcanism. Uh, we can use it to provide an absolute chronology. I was talking about how we count craters. We can use it to try and understand how and when the giant planets migrated. We think the, the solar system was very active earlier on and things were moving around. And we can use our understanding of the, of the uh, of the moon and when things impacted to try to understand what the timing of those uh, migrations were. We can explore craters to understand the physics of impact cratering. That is the most prominent, prevalent geologic process across the solar system and the, the moon is a great laboratory to study that. Um, we can use the radio quiet of the lunar far side, right? We'd like, to, we'd like to put our radio telescope on the far side. It's the one place where we won't have to worry about interference from radio waves here on Earth. Uh, and that will allow us to actually see back to the, to the cosmic dawn, to the very beginning, the Big Bang, the earliest moments of our solar system. Um, and, and that's the only place we can do it, is on the far side of the moon. Uh, and we, we'd like to try to understand our sun better, right? There, there are a number of things you can do um, on the moon to help us understand better our, our sun and, and the way that the sun interacts with the moon. So uh, as much as I like to think it's all about the moon, it's not just about the moon. The moon is, is sort of a cornerstone for understanding the whole solar system. So, and of course, it's, it's, it's also not just about the moon. This campaign um, that we are on now is about, is about using the moon as well to help us uh, eventually move on to Mars. Um, and so there's a whole uh, number of things. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, here's sort of the, the giant plan, right, of, of Artemis uh, to get humans to the moon very soon, 2024. Uh, we've also got Mars 2020 launching. That is the first step towards Mars sample return. Um, my part in this, actually, though, is the, is the bit on the bottom there, the, the commercial lunar payload services. I'm very excited about this. This is a, this is a new thing for NASA. Um, if you guys remember the Google Lunar X Prize, there were a number of teams out there. Nobody, nobody won, but there were a number of teams that tried very hard to get uh, to the moon uh, for the Google Lunar X Prize, and a lot of them got very close. 
And a number of those teams now um, are on contract with NASA to provide commercial lunar payload services, by which we mean uh, we will provide them a payload, whatever instruments we want to send to the moon, and they are like FedEx, that they will deliver those payloads for us and, and send us back our data. And so we've been working really hard on this. Um, we've got actually just announced um, last month, we, we've selected three of these, of these teams to, to actually fly to the moon over the next two years. Uh, one as early as, as, as September 2020 and just over a year from now, the other two, um, two years from now. Um, and this is just the beginning. Our plan is to, is to keep sending these, like one or two of them a year, every year, um, mostly for science reasons, but also uh, as a way to support the humans um, to, to you know, deliver cargo and whatnot. And the idea is that many of these companies um, are, are designed to not just be a delivery service for NASA, but they are actually um, building um, a plan to, to use, uh, to, to bring in other customers. Uh, Astrobotic in particular has, has a, a, like more than a dozen other customers, other, other countries, universities, um, all sorts of things that want to send their stuff to the moon. Uh, and, and if you do it in bulk, right, it becomes cheap enough that, that um, you know, it becomes a, a viable business. And so the idea is these guys will grow and evolve and, and their capabilities will mature and we can use them. We can use them for science, but they will also, um, you know, make money on their own as well. And so I we wish them all well. And I think this is a really um, great um, beginning for, for um, partnership between us and, and the commercial industry to, to sort of build on each other um, and expand our capabilities on the moon rather than NASA just paying for everything. Okay, that's, that's the end. Um, I'm happy to take questions. All right, and it looks like we've got quite a few questions here already and we'll probably end up having some more coming up here. And so I just want to remind everyone that if you do have a question to please put it in the Q&A window that will help us uh, keep track of it and things tend to get lost in the chat window. And so if you could please put that in the Q&A window, um, that'll make life easier for all of us. So a long time ago, way back at the beginning, Bill asked the question and you, you talked about this uh, a little bit, but maybe not uh, some of the, the differences. He was wondering about the difference between the near and the far side crust. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question, and it's one we have spent a lot of time thinking about and don't actually have um, answers. We can tell you that the crust is thicker on the far side than it is on the near side, and that's why most of the volcanism happened on the near side, because it didn't have as far to go to get through the crust. But we don't really know why the far side is thicker than the near side. There are a number of um, theories about this. There's, there's one theory that suggests um, I love this theory. I don't think it's right, but I think it's really cool. Yeah, that suggests that that actually when the when the moon first formed, there were two, um, and, and a big one and a small one, and the small one sort of collided and stuck on the far side, and that's why we have it's thicker on that side. Um, there's another theory that suggests that the Earth was so hot uh, that it was radiating enough heat. The Earth and the moon were much closer then, and the Earth was radiating enough heat that it kept the near side warmer, and so the the crust there just didn't get as thick. Um, uh, there are not, nobody, nobody has coalesced on a, on a theory yet, but there are a number of good ideas out there. So, you know, that's still a real open question. All right. Okay, Adrian asked a question, and, and I know that you alluded to the seismic network and the hope to have that. Uh, how much risk to future moon missions would there be without a moon-wide seis uh, seismometry data? Yeah, that's a good question. We do know that we get um, moonquakes um, that are up to about uh, fives or so on the Richter scale. So um, that would be something that might be a little scary for, for astronauts. Um, we do actually know that the, that the moon is shrinking and so we can actually see um, new ridges and things being formed. So there is sort of tectonic activity happening on the moon. Um, we do know from the, from the Apollo Seismic Network that there are sort of nests of where um, these earthquakes are sort of clustered. Uh, so those are probably not great places to build up infrastructure. So we can probably sort of avoid those. Um, but it is something, it is something to, be, to, to, to think about uh, when, you, when you're planning for where you're gonna put your habitat down. Yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of going along with the idea about uh, habitats. And so Jeremiah asked about uh, the potential of uh, 
uh, cave systems on the moon as uh, potential sites to protect um, the explorers. And yeah, this is an idea that's been around for a while. Uh, we do know that there are uh, pits and probably lava tubes uh, on the Mare parts. Um, these are volcanic structures. And what happens is uh, you get a sort of cr crust on the top that, that cools, but there's still lava flowing underneath. And it sort of flows out and leaves behind an empty uh, tube um, cave. And those are protected from radiation that there are some pluses there. Uh, but if you've ever gone uh, caving, if you've ever tried to wander around in these things, it's not easy. It's not easy to get into and out of. You remember you'll have people in spacesuits. Spacesuit designers um, put up conniption fits because they think you, you might tear. Uh, um, so for, for safety reasons, I think that we're at the very least a long way off from considering those as habitats. Um, but scientifically, they're, they're, they're probably really interesting places to explore. So I'm hoping at least robotically we will be able to um, get in and explore some of those uh, lava tubes and caves. I think they're very cool. All right. So Cook asked a question. And uh, so you, you related some of the mineralogy differences between the different uh, areas on the moon. And so Cook was wondering about the isotopic similarities between the earth and moon and uh, what, how the, uh, uh, the impact um, I guess, impact hypothesis for the formation, how that might have uh, affected the, uh, uh, the, those similarities. Yeah, so the, the moon and the earth are, are incredibly similar in their isotopic uh, signatures, um, which is one of uh, the evidence um, for the, the idea that they, they must have formed in the same part of the solar system. Because if we look at you know, Mars, if we look at the asteroids, um, other planets, they have very different isotopic signatures. Um, and so um, it sort of cuts both ways. Um, there are those who say that, that in fact, the, the isotopic signatures are, are too exact um, to ma matching, that it, it can't be a, a, a giant impact hypothesis because you would have had some fractionation uh, between them. It wouldn't have um, mixed so well. Um, on the other hand, if you're made out of the same stuff, right, it's all the same material, presumably the impactor must have been uh, made of similar material as well. You can see how it would all be the same. We actually have uh, recent years, there have been some evidence that in fact, there are some subtle differences that we didn't used to have the resolution to see, but now we do actually see um, some subtle differences in their isotopic compositions, which, which actually gives more credibility to the giant impact hypothesis. But there are still, these, these arguments um, still, still go on between the isotopic folks. I, I, um, I have to admit that I, I don't get too, too deeply involved in this, <laughs> those, uh, down at the you know, like fourth and fifth decimal point, but um, they're very important to those guys. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really amazing how the, uh, the, the ratios between different isotopes uh, really can, you know, provide an awful lot of information. Yeah. Earth yes, once the, again, uh, right, samples oh, yeah. are, are a gift that keeps on giving, right, because as, as, uh, as our technology improves, right, we can go back and relook at samples and we find new things because we have um, higher resolution, higher power, um, new techniques. Um, so that's one of the, the best things about having samples is that is that we can keep using them um, and keep learning from them, uh, and that's and that's one of the reasons why we take such good care of them, where we we curate them so carefully, is so that future generations will still have access to them. Although I guess there's a there, there's a few stray samples that were given away that no one's quite sure where they are too. So. <laughs> Yeah, it happens. We actually keep a pretty we we um we, we keep a very close eye on on the on the samples, but there are the the ones you're talking about are when when uh when Apollo came back back they had these um goodwill samples that they they gave out very small uh, rock samples that they they gave out to heads of states around the world, um and some of those heads of states you know were later deposed or whatever like unstable countries and and a few a few of those have gone missing over the years so. Um, yeah, there are a few floating around, so we don't know where they are. <laughs> we had Mike Zelensky from uh, the Astro Materials Lab um, with us in earlier this spring, and he gave a really fascinating presentation about uh, um, all the different materials they have down at Johnson Space Center. And so for those yes. of you that are interested, go to the NSN website or our YouTube channel, and you can check that out. So, um, so back to this. So Haley asked a really 
interesting question. Um, seeing as how we uh, you use the moon's craters as a way of age dating, is that similar to age dating uh, trees with their rings? Um, yes and no. The the nice thing about age dating trees with their rings is that it's an exact science. You can you can count them right and you have an exact date whereas whereas crater counting is again it's about relative right it's about this this surface is younger than that surface but i don't know how old this surface is um so uh it's it's not it's more of an art <laughs> well it's probably more of the uh you know back in when you take the geology classes it probably has more to do with uh you know relative dating and, and what crosses what and, and, yep. and things like that. So um, Ron asked the question, how many new craters have we found on the moon since Apollo? That is a great question. We have found um, since, uh, since LRO has been up there, 10 years this month actually, um, we have found uh, a lot, hundreds uh, of new craters that have occurred that we, that we see in LRO images because LRO, um, repeatedly images the same areas over and over again. Um, we've tried to go back and do some comparison with Apollo uh, imagery, imagery, but it's it's harder it's good because it's a different camera and whatever. It's it's not quite as easy to to find them. But uh, the the LRO ones you can do difference images, and if, actually if you go to the LROC website, um, you'll find some. You can find some of these where where they you can see the before and after. Uh, and you can actually see the the craters, um, and and we've seen the craters that we've made, right? So we, we've impacted um, a couple of spacecraft, the Laddie spacecraft, the Grail spacecrafts. Um, uh, unfortunately, the the bear sheet, the Israeli spacecraft that that attempted a landing a couple months ago, um, and and some of the Apollo um, um, rockets and whatnot. And so we've been able to find those over the year. We can we can see those impacts as well. So even even the ones we've made. Um, which is fascinating, and so you can see these very, very young ones in there, and how they, they even, even they weather uh, so quickly. Okay, kind of staying with uh, with mineralogy here, we've got a couple of terminology questions that. Uh, so Greg Gregory notes that he hears the terms mafic and creep. I think K R E E P is an acronym actually for something when referred to moon rocks. What exactly do those mean? Yeah, so creep. Right, so if you ever hear your, your lunar geologists talk about their creepy rocks, it's not that they're like haunted or anything. Creep stands for uh, potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus. Uh, and these are sort of the last dregs of things. These are the, the incompatible elements that don't like to go into minerals. So as the, as the moon is forming, right, and all the plagioclase is coming to the top and all the olivine and pyroxene is going to the bottom, the creep is the last stuff, is the last sandwich of stuff that doesn't want to go into anything that gets of leftover, it's the very last things to form minerals. Um, mafic is a is a term for um, how how much um, iron rich minerals are in your rock. So so basalt is a is a very mafic rock. That's the the darker rocks. All right. Yeah, for those geologists out there, uh, if you understand a little about about Bowen's reaction series, that would help understand that a little bit. <laughs> So you know what I mean, Sarah. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, Lori asked a question, is lunar anorthosite now called plagioclase feldspar for highland rocks? Uh, those, are the, those are the same thing. So anorthosite is the, is the so plagioclase feldspar is the, feldspar is the general class of minerals. Anorthosite is the specific name for the end member, the, the calcium end member of that. There's a series, um, you can substitute sodium instead of calcium in that, in that feldspar series. But the moon, right, because it was violent and hot and whatever, it lost most of its sodium. That's a very volatile material. So it's mostly calcium. And so it's mostly the end member, which is the anorthosite. Okay, well, back to uh, human exploration here. Lane asks, uh, is there enough water in the moon to actually support life there, such as a long-term space base? Uh, that is, uh, precisely the question that that we are trying to answer right now, right? So um, we don't know. Um, I showed you the evidence we have that there is at least some water there, but we don't know how much it is. We don't know how thick those ice deposits are, how extensive they are, whether they're renewable or if it's a one-time deal. Uh, there's a lot of questions we don't really still understand about that. Uh, it's one of our 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 first targets um, when we go back to the moon. That is 
one of the reasons we're going to the South Pole is so that we can sort of investigate that and find out. It's always easier to, to bring, uh, to, to live off the land than it is to bring uh, all of your own supplies. And so um, hopefully we'll find that there's enough water that's usable. It's not the only reason we're going to the South Pole though. The actual um, main reason we wanna go to the South Pole is the, is the other resources there and that's the sunlight, right? Next to all these permanently shadowed re regions are the regions that have um, almost permanent sunlight. And so um, that is the energy source that we're actually going to the South Pole to find. Water would certainly be a bonus and would definitely help us um, with our long-term plans, uh, both for the moon and, and uh, moving, moving off the planet, moving, moving to Mars, uh, because if you, you can, you know, if there's enough water that you can have a fuel depot and you can, you know, uh, produce water that you don't have to get off of the Earth's gravity well, um, then that will help us explore other places in the solar system too. All right. Okay, Gloria asked a question and back to, uh, you know, sticking with the idea of humans uh, going to the moon. According to NASA press releases, NASA will send the first woman to the moon by 2024. Do you know the name of the female astronaut or maybe some of the ones uh, that are tr in training who's uh, going to be chosen for this? Yeah, it hasn't been announced. Um, I, heard a, I heard a hint that, that, that Brian Stein gave something away the other day that he said it was somebody who had already flown. So that narrows it down to a, to a few dozen or a couple dozen uh, options. Um, I don't think it's been, I, I don't know that it's actually been decided yet. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, if I knew I couldn't tell you, but I don't actually know. <laughs> um, I do know that we're working, uh, working very hard to, to train them, right? One of the one of the key things about Apollo, right, was not just that we had humans with their human brains, but that we had really well-trained um, geologists, right? Only one of the Apollo astronauts was had a geology background, but by the time they were done with their training course, they all had about the equivalent to a master's degree in geology. They were really, really well-trained. They spent a lot of time out in the field learning how to, you know, how to be a field geologist, how to ask the right questions, how to pick up the right rocks, and it really made a difference uh, in the rocks that they found and the, the geology that they did in the field. And so we are in the midst of, of sort of ramping that up um, and trying to figure out how to, how to train this next generation. They already have a slight advantage because we've, we've been training them um, at least a bit uh, on geology for the last decade or so. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're working on, on ramping that up and making sure that, that we have really well-trained uh, field geologists out there uh, when they do land. Probably at this point, uh, uh, one of the main constraints for training is uh, the lack of a, a vehicle to train with. So, you know, that's kind of a, something that has to happen so you can get there to do the geology. So. Uh, sh sh sure, we're, we're, we're working on that too. That's, oh, I know, that's not I my know. department. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> they all fit together somehow, so. Okay, Carol asks uh, if you could recommend a location on the moon for the astronauts to land and explore, where would it be? Oh, if I could pick, if I could pick, I mean, personally, if I could pick, I would like to go to a swirl. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the lunar swirls, but there are these places on the moon. Um, wish I had a picture to pull up right now, and I don't. Uh, there are the places on the moon where, um, where there are some wonky magnetic field things happening that causes um, just really incredible swirly patterns in the, uh, in the soils um, that we don't understand. Um, it has to do with, with, again, the space weathering that I was talking about, how you make surfaces darker, but not uniformly. It has to do with the magnetic field, perhaps uh, blocking the sun, uh, the solar wind in those places. Uh, we're not, we don't really sh know for sure, but and I, and I think it would be a really fantastic mission to go and find that out. That's a, that's a personal one that in more, more generally, I, mean, I talked about visiting the, the, some of the youngest volcanics. I think if you asked your average lunar geologist, that's, that's high on their list too. Um, there's a couple other spots. There's the, the Aristarchus Plateau, sort of that bright spot on the, on the left side of the moon in, in, the, in the midst of the big dark swirl there. There's one very bright spot and that's, there's some really cool geology to be found there. Um, again, there are, there are places where I talked about where we know that there are new minerals that, that we didn't sample um, during Apollo. Uh, I would love to go to one of those spots. They're mostly hard to get to. They're like in the sides of crater rims. 
uh, or central peaks of craters, which make them a little challenging for landing. But eventually, I hope that we are, are have the capabilities to explore some of those more difficult spots. Um, and then, you know, the poles. We talked about the poles, but that's where that is where we're going, and it is one of the places that I think lunar scientists are very excited about visiting. We've had quite a few uh, questions regarding uh, meteor impacts from uh, a question about how great would the threat be um, to the uh, astronauts there, um, to what's the rate of micrometeorite impacts on the moon because you know they, they don't get burned up and, and we yeah. don't see them as pretty streaks across the sky in the, in, in the moon, um, to you know some of the other ideas about uh, you know how can they protect themselves? And so any comment about uh, um, any of these meteorite things? Um, yeah, so it's certainly something that, that you know, especially if you're building a long-term habitat, it's something you, you have to think about. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't worry too much. I think the, the statistical odds of like a random micrometeorite hitting you as you're walking around the surface are probably uh, really incredibly low. They're not zero, but they're, they're probably not something that would, that would be a showstopper. Um, but I think if you have a habitat that, you, that is you know, permanent that you wanna have there for uh, a long period of time, you better be prepared um, to, you know, for it to occasionally get hit with things. Um, and so you know, I think that is something that they are, are thinking about. I, I think um, in the scheme of things, I, I would be much more concerned about radiation than micrometeorite impacts. I think that is a, a harder, harder problem to solve and a more immediate danger for astronauts. Okay, going back in, in time, back uh, I guess to the beginning of the moon, Mark uh, asks if a Mars-sized object, and if we're, if we're thinking of the big impact or hypothesis, if a Mars-sized object struck a glancing blow to the Earth, where did the object go? So how uh, did that kind of work? It, yeah, sure, <laughs> it, became, it became part. It became part of the Earth and part of the moon, right? It sort of got absorbed um, by, by the, the earth moon system. Right. And so it's, it's in both of us. I think, uh, I think they think, I mean, you can make your models do a lot of things, but I think they think that more of the impactor went into the moon than the earth, but the core of, of the impactor would have stayed with the earth. And so we got more of the mantle of the impactor, I think is how they, they currently think that, that it sort of wor worked itself out. Okay. D asked a question, is one lunar pole more favorable to a base than the other? Um, yes, uh, I think mostly because um, I showed you all those pictures of the South Pole and that is where we're planning to go. Uh, and I think that has largely to do with um, the fact that LRO um, was in a, is a very elliptical orbit um, and so it, it was always at its closest approach around the South Pole. Um, and so we have the best data there. Our data for the North Pole is, is much lower resolution. Um, and, I, and so I think that's part of what's driving uh, our um, preference for the South Pole. I think the reason that we picked that orbit for LRO is because the, the South Pole has more permanently shadowed um, area than the North Pole. I think that's, that might be true. Uh, but regardless, that is now where we have the good data that we're going to need um, in order to to navigate and, and choose landing sites. So that's why we're going to the South Pole. Okay, so uh, I'm, we're going to go for just a couple more questions here. And so we had two uh, people, Doug and um, I don't remember who knew, um, noted about that there was uh, an announcement of an impactor that was uh, perhaps discovered below the South Pole. Do we have any idea of uh, what that is? And I'm not I don't recall having read that, so I can't elaborate on the questions. So. I don't recall. I'm not sure what they're referring to either. So let's see if they, yeah, they just said that there was a mass, apparently, you know, two people noted that there was a mass that was recently reported under the moon South Pole, and so... Oh, I know what they're talking right. about. So, uh, not under the South Pole, but under the South Pole Aiken Basin. Um, uh, so, that giant, that giant crater, right, that covers like a third of the moon, right? Um, they recently have uh, some, done some modeling that shows that there's like a, a big mass concentration underneath it. Um, 
there's one theory that suggests maybe that has to do with the impactor. Maybe it was a big metal impactor and that's the big massive metal that is underneath it. More likely than that, that might, that is a possibility, but more likely than that, uh, what happened was that, that, that impactor uh, broke through the crust and, and has um, pulled some of the mantle up. Um, and then that mantle material is denser than the crust material, right? That's the, that's the stuff that sank, right? So it's denser. And so that's, that the, 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 the impact has sort of, push that stuff up closer to the surface. And so there's more mass concentrated near the surface um, where the South Lake Basin is than, than other parts of the moon. And so I think that's the, the mass concentration. Or possibly it's the giant metal impactor underneath. I'm not, <laughs> the, the paper put out both hypotheses. I think, one, I think one is more logical than the other, but I'm not, I'm not gonna discount the other. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's go for one more. And uh, we apologize to everyone who have uh, some really great questions. We are just running out of time to uh, uh, get to them all. Uh, so Adrian asks, what has surprised you, and maybe scientists in general, researchers in general, what has surprised you most about the moon? Uh, so about a decade ago. So for 40 years, we had these lunar samples in our collections, and we were studying them, and we thought they were bone dry, right? We've talked about how, you know, it was a big violent collision and all the volatiles, all the water disappeared and the samples that we brought back from the moon were completely dry. The moon doesn't have any water in it. And then about 10 years ago, um, a scientist at, at, at Brown University actually um, found water in the samples. Um, and he was, a, he was an earth scientist. He came at this from a, from a different perspective. You know, all of the planetary geologists were like, why are you bothering to look at this? We all know, we all know that the moon is dry. Why would you even bother to look? But he's coming at it from a different perspective. Uh, and he actually had, uh, again, the capability, the resolution to, to look inside some of these samples at a finer scale than, than others had. And he actually found out that, that if you look closely enough, there actually is water uh, in some of these lunar samples. Um, native water, water that that you know erupted in these volcanoes um, when the when these when the volcanoes originally erupted, um, and it sort of revolutionized our thinking about the moon, which is really incredible and is, is again a great statement for why samples are important, but also a great statement for why it, it's always good to to hang a question mark on things that you have long taken for granted. Yeah. All right. Well, it'll be exciting to uh, go back and to discover more things that we have no idea about. That's uh, that's kind of the nature of those whole. That's the one thing I can guarantee is that we will find surprises and and things that we weren't <laughs> thinking about. Yes. All right. Well, well, lots of interesting days ahead. So, and that's all for tonight. You'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We will post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel within the next few days. Also, check out the resources and activities from the new Lunar Toolkit, including a set of slides about human exploration. Thank you, everyone.